Thank you very much, Wes, and, and indeed welcome everyone. It's my honor and privilege today to open this event in the memory of James Crawford, eminent scholar and generous mentor, brilliant advocate and daunting adversary, esteemed judge and arbitrator. The wonderful array of speakers with us today alone are a testament to the deep impact that James had on all of our lives, as well as the development of international law. I want to thank ASIL's International Courts and Tribunals Interest Group and their co-chairs, Dave Figge and Freya Betans, for bringing us together today. So speaking on behalf of ASIL, I'm happy to say that we've had the benefit of a lifetime of devotion that James had for the society. His involvement with ASIL began as an author and academic when in 1979, he published his first article in the American Journal of International Law entitled International Law Standard in the Statutes of Australia and the United Kingdom. His scholarship was recognized early on when at just 33, he was awarded ASIL's Certificate of Merit for Creative Scholarship for his book based on his formidable dissertation on the creation of states in international law. He then went on to publish seven more articles in AGIL, including his 2002 retrospect on the ILC articles on state responsibility. Beginning in 2004, James served as a member of AGIL's board of editors and year after year spoke at the annual meeting on a dizzying array of topics from the future of investment international law to the implications of the 2003 Iraq war. And on the sidelines of the ASIL meeting, James often reprised his role as judge and mentor sitting as judge in the final rounds of the Philip Jessup International Law Moot Court competition. In 2012, in recognition of his scholarship, his achievements, his contribution to the field of international law, the society awarded him the Manly O. Hudson Medal, placing him firmly in the pantheon of international law. The achievements I've just described are but one facet of a man who was at once deeply humorous and deeply serious about the rule of law to which he was so devoted. I very much look forward to hearing from those who knew him best in the celebration of his legacy. On behalf of ASIL, we are indebted to James Crawford for his singular contribution to the enterprise that is international law and for the inspiration to all of us, especially now to keep going and strive to build a better, more peaceful world. Thank you very much and with that, let me hand it over to Dr. Massimo Lando, Professor of School of Law, City University of Hong Kong, to serve as the Master of Ceremonies. Dr. Lando. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you to all the speakers for joining us today. Um, I have to make a small um, uh, point at the beginning of the proceedings because uh, Judge Hilary Charlesworth, unfortunately, uh, was not able to um, join us today. Because as you know, uh, the hearings in the Ukraine uh, and Russian Federation case are ongoing in The Hague at the moment, and she had a last minute uh, ICJ commitment that she could not uh, move. Now, we will hear today from a number of persons who, besides being eminent international lawyers in their own right, were close to James Crawford in one capacity or another. Now, James is a man who really needs no introduction, and I will not spend any more words introducing him than uh, in addition to those that Catherine has already uh, put into, uh, into the event for us. Now, our speakers will in turn speak about James Crawford in one of the several capacities in which he worked as an international lawyer over the years. We will hear about James Crawford as a judge and an arbitrator from Ms. Loretta Malintopi and Professor Giorgio Gaia. Then we'll hear about James Crawford as an academic from Sir Christopher Greenwood, followed by James Crawford as a research mentor, Dr. Romiana Yotova and Dr. Ralph Wilde. Uh, Mr. Paul Reichler and Mr. Simon Ollison will speak to us about James Crawford as a counsel before international courts and tribunals. And we will finish up the event with a few remarks from Professor John Dugard, who will speak to us about James Crawford as a member of the International Law Commission. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, and that is Ms. Loretta Malintopi. Thank you very much, Loretta. Thank you very much, Massimo. And I would like to thank you in particular for inviting me to participate in this event commemorating James, whom we sorely miss. And I'm particularly pleased to be sharing this first panel with Judge Giorgio Gaia, whom I admire greatly. I will start out with a bit of background about how I met James first. I'm supposed to be speaking of James as an arbitrator tonight, but uh, 
I met James the first time in 1991 when we were both representing Libya in the Libya Chad case before the International Court of Justice, which was my first ICJ case, and I believe was James's second case after Nauru. And as I was thinking of my remarks for today, I recall that in the 30 years that I've known James, I've worked with him and against him as counsel in nine cases before the ICJ and in state-to-state -state arbitrations. I've also pleaded before him as a judge in the ICJ. But in contrast, I've only sat in an arbitral tribunal with James once in a case which was an exit arbitration in the field of renewable energy between two German companies and the Kingdom of Spain, where he was appointed as the presiding arbitrator by the exit secretary general. So all in all, I have more memories and anecdotes of James as counsel than as arbitrator. But as I ponder this a bit more in search for something specific to say about James as an arbitrator, I realized that the same intellectual qualities and human traits that were so characteristic of James simply as a person shone through particularly clearly in his work as an arbitrator. In an article that he published in the American University Law Review in 2019, James wrote about the ideal arbitrator and mused on whether such a perfect arbitral being does exist in real life. And he concluded that there can be no ideal arbitrator. And he said that tribunals are composed of a variety of legal backgrounds and as such will tend to produce better reasoned decisions. And in his view, particularly in investor state arbitration, which was a case that we had, more diverse tribunal might be better suited than uh, to the resolution of this type of disputes than a straight hand, and I'm using his words, a straight hand of commercial arbitrators or a single species of international law. So as an arbitrator, I believe that James combined exceptionally the qualities of an international lawyer, but also understood the value and contribution of commercial lawyers from a variety of legal backgrounds. With James, there was no civil law or common law divide. He was, but this was particularly evident in his work as an advocate, but was also apparent when he sat as an arbitrator, at least in my very limited experience. I should also add that James took very seriously the question of independence and impartiality of arbitrators. He wrote extensively and spoke on the subject. To my knowledge, he was never at the receiving end of a request for disqualification or a challenge. And he appreciated the different expectations of the presiding arbitrator as opposed to a party appointed arbitrator and assimilated the role of the latter to a judge ad hoc in ICJ proceedings so that party appointed arbitrators ensure that the arguments the party that appointed them be fully understood and considered by the tribunal while making sure that these considerations do not override their independent professional judgment. When it comes to story and anecdotes, I have many, but they don't concern so much uh, James as an arbitrator. But perhaps one of the most striking qualities that James had was the clarity and lucidity of his thought process. For some of us, and certainly I, revise and edit their drafts numerous times, this exercise seemed effortless, James. He could sit down and produce a document in practically final form the first time around. I remember one time when we worked together as counsel representing Iran in the IACJ oil platform case, and James was working on his rebuttal speech for the following day, and it was probably very early in the morning. He typically worked very early in the morning. He spilled coffee over his laptop, which promptly crashed, and he lost his speech completely. After a first reaction of legitimate anger and frustration and some activities, frantic activities from the IT team who eventually found a new computer, he started drafting again with a vengeance. And the new draft that he produced no more than two hours later was, by his own admission as well, much better than the first. <laughs> 
During our exit arbitration together, whenever we received a draft from James, I struggled to come up with comments or proposals for revisions. His drafts weren't that good. Another memory I have was when he and his wife Freya visited Singapore a few years ago. I was writing an article at the time, it was almost finished, but I wasn't happy with it. Everything I wanted to cover was there, but somehow the structure didn't work. I told James over lunch at our place and he offered to read my article and provide some comments. So while I chatted with Ray in a corner, he sat down at our dining room table and in about half an hour, he marked up and improved my draft considerably. All he did was to move a paragraph here and there and add a few words, but the result was brilliant. What I tried and failed to accomplish before. A few remarks at the end about what, uh, what I think were the things I learned from working with James as an arbitrator. We all know that he was a man of extraordinary intelligence. During my career, I've had the great fortune of working with some of the leading international lawyers of our time. But working with James and being confronted with, by, with and challenged by his intelligence was for me a humbling experience and one that made my own work better every time. He was always respectful of his colleagues, no matter how young or inexperienced. And he always asked for and listened to, because he was a very good listener, the views of others. He was never arrogant or conceited, but he could probe and question his colleagues during discussion. When he disagreed, he was firm, but always sought to find a common ground. He was extremely hardworking and had an impressive ability to recognize the key aspects of a case, something which certainly was the product of his extensive experience as counsel, but was also an innate count and quality that he had. In these traits and qualities, together with James' independence and impartiality, come very close to the making of the idea arbitrator. I learned a great deal from his example. In the article that James published in the American University Law Review that I mentioned earlier, he recognized that in the field of investment arbitration, public international law and commercial international arbitration coexist in some tension. At the same time, he did not believe that this amounted to a veritable cultural clash as some other scholars um, refer to. And he invited public international lawyers above all to be flexible and incorporate the learning of private international lawyers in their own field, just as the reverse may be true. To conclude my brief remarks, here's one of the lessons I will always remember from James as I continue to act as an arbitrator in investor state disputes. To use his own words, investment arbitration allows for insights from the two fields to be combined and we should be open to the mixing of ideas rather than treating it as a source of chaos and division. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I will give the floor now over to Professor Gaia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Massimo. I'm very grateful to have been invited to this webinar for giving the opportunity to share a few memories of a great scholar and practitioner who was also a dear friend. At the court, I was one of the judges who was closest to James. We had a long standing friendship and similar views on several key issues of international law. I had been a member of the International Law Commission when James led it to adopt the Articles on State Responsibility, one of the Commission's greatest achievements. During the drafting of these articles and their commentaries, we had frequent exchanges, so much so that James once told me that when he became aware of certain shortcomings, luckily not many, in the adopted text, he would blame me for not having pointed these out during the preparatory work. 
James Brilliance has a scholar and has a council and his extensive involvement in judicial and arbitral litigation made him uniquely qualified to have a leading role in the court. However, his contribution to the court's work was limited by two factors. First, he had to recuse himself several times because he had been involved in the preparation of the case by one of the parties. He also could not take part in the advisory opinion on Chekhov's. In more recent years, his health limited his participation in other cases. Thus, out of the 20 judgments on the merits or on preliminary objection that the court gave during James' term of office, he took part in only 13, and for some recent judgment, he could attend only part of the deliberations. It is a source of deep regret that James did not have the opportunity to display his talents as a judge more fully. In the court's practice, judges exchange only occasional comments before they meet for the first round of deliberation. They then present their views following the order of seniority in reverse. When it came to James' turn to speak, one could sense that he commanded his colleagues' closest attention. Colleague judges are always attentive, but they can be more attentive in certain cases. His initial statement did not necessarily express his final views on the decision of the case. In one or two instances, he radically changed his position after the first round of the liberations. Later exchanges between judges may lead to joint declaration of opinions. The name of the more senior judges always mentioned first in these opinions, irrespective of who drafted the text. When James and I made a joint declaration in the case of the maritime delimitation in the Indian Ocean at the stage of preliminary objections, we put forward two ideas, one concerning jurisdiction and the other the admissibility of the claim. We shared the drafting. I dealt with this with the first question and James with the second one. And I hope I don't reveal anything too secret. Finally, I would like to say something about James' role in the Rules Committee. At a time where the committee produced various proposals, most of which were in substance adopted by the court. Little is known about what led to these changes. The liberation in the Rules Committee are only summarily recorded and are not made public. The results are, but only those. James' contribution mainly concerned two issues. First of all, he attempted to remove from the rules of provision, which is in Article 56, Paragraph 4, which allows a party to produce a document as evidence as late as the stage of the oral proceeding. Should the document be, quote, part of a publication readily available, unquote. He made the point that nowadays a document can be easily made accessible through internet. He argued that the late publication, the late allegation of a document may be unfair to the other party, and that a strict criterion was needed in the interest of a more appropriate handling of evidence. In spite of the cogency of James' argument, there was no agreement in the plenary on the wording of the text designed to replace what is incontrovertibly an inadequate phrase. Thus, this proposal did not succeed. James was on the contrary successful in proposing a more active role of the court 
with regard to the implementation of provisional measures while the principal case is pending. Since the grand judgment, provisional measures are considered to be binding. Yet the court had failed to build a monitoring process. It wasn't working on the replies, on, on the comments by the parties. The new Article 11 of the Resolution on Internal Judicial Practice is based on James' proposal. For each case in which provisional measures are adopted, the court now appoints a committee of three judges with the task of studying the file relating to the provisional measures and making proposals to the full court. The committee may suggest the court to require from the parties some clarifications or to modify the measures, something that the court can now do also on its own motion after a modification of Article 76, paragraph one. These may be small steps, but they are definitely steps in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gaia. Um, I believe that now it is uh, Sir Christopher Greenwood's turn. We will hear from him now. Thank you very much, Sir Christopher. Thank you very much, Massimo. Um, it's a great pleasure and source of pride to be able to take part in this webinar in honor of James. But of course, the reason why we're doing so is an exceedingly sad one. Um, I've been asked to talk about James as an academic. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of speaking for slightly longer than I was originally going to do because Hilary Charlesworth, as has been explained, cannot be with us. And while I wouldn't dream of speaking for Judge Charlesworth, I am going to make a couple of the points that she said she would have made had she been here. Now, although my brief is to talk about James as an academic, I think it's important to realise that with James, his world was not divided up into compartments. The academic rigour, the intellect, the learning that he brought to his university teaching and writing was just as present in his work as counsel, in his work as um, an arbitrator, and latterly as a judge. And indeed, many of us knew him in more than one of those capacities. There was a period of just two years in the early 2000s uh, when he and I, by my reckoning, appeared as counsel on the same side in one case, on opposite sides in another, as expert witnesses for opposing parties in an arbitration. Uh, I appeared in front of him in an arbitration and he appeared in front of me in an arbitration. Uh, later, we sat together as judges, although for far too short a time. Now, the sheer scale of James's academic writing is something which is, is hard to take into account in a way, it's hard to measure. And just to take the four of the big books for which he's famous, The Creation of States in International Law, his editions of Brownlee's International Law, his book on state responsibility, and his Hague Lectures, the general course, uh, given while he was appearing as counsel in the International Court at the same time in the Whaling case. But even those are only the tip of a much larger iceberg. There is a huge body of writing, um, probably one surpassing that of almost any other academic, and certainly uh, unmatched in terms of quantity and quality by anyone else. And one of the things that was remarkable about his work is the sheer breadth of his scholarship and his interests. Walter Scott once said that a lawyer without history or literature is a mere mechanic, a mere working mason. If he has some knowledge of these, he may venture to call himself an architect. Now today we might cavil at the rather patronizing reference to mere working masons and mere mechanics. But what I think we would all agree on is that James was very much an architect. He was somebody whose writing on international law was infused not just with an unrivaled knowledge of international law, but with an extraordinary grasp of history and literature, and indeed art as well. If one looks at his Hague lectures from 2014, they include alongside the normal references to uh, legal texts and case law, references to Thucydides, to Ezra Pound, and indeed to a more modern cultural point of reference, the excellent satirical show, Yes Minister, 
which is quoted at the beginning of one of the lectures. Um, Hillary, in her article in the Leyden Journal of International Law, uh, makes the point that he also spent a great deal of time choosing the work of art that adorns the front cover of the paperback edition of the lectures, which I will hold up for you now. Kenneth Martin's painting of the same name as uh, James's course of lectures, Chance, Order, Change. He also had a remarkable ability to bring together theory and practice in his writing. If you look at his Cambridge Companion to International Law, the dialogue there with Marty Koskinyemi, of the, um, the, the disappointed positivist and the naive cynic, is one of the best pieces of theoretical writing that you can find. But it sits alongside essentially practical work. Um, he was a builder of international law. His book on state responsibility, which came out of his work at the International Law Commission on the same subject, is something which frames certainly how we see international law on state responsibility. But I think it frames what is the international law on state responsibility. And I should add that James would greatly have enjoyed the debate about whether uh, what we see as the subject and what the subject actually is can be separated in any way. Uh, it's a debate that he would definitely have enjoyed taking part in. Or if you take his book on the creation of states in international law, that is the ultimate work of reference and is likely to remain so for all time coming about how states are created and indeed sometimes how they disappear. Uh, it's a work that is replete with historical scholarship, with a mastery of the public records of more than one country. It's a way of, it, is, it shows how a host of colonies and other territories ended up as independent states and what precise form that path to independence took. It's a quite remarkable book. And I can remember when I sat as an arbitrator in the Chagos arbitration, having a wonderful dialogue with James, or rather asking a question which provoked a wonderful answer from James about the creation of states and agreements made between a colonial power and the outgoing colonial government on the eve of independence. A subject which I'm fairly sure uh, had not been written about anywhere and which James had to deal with by not exactly making it up as he went along, but by drawing on the depth of his learning to answer a question that perhaps wasn't what he had expected in that particular case. I'd also mention James as a teacher in academic life, because he would have been one of the first to disparage the modern fashion for distinguishing between the researcher and the teacher. For James, they were one and the same. If you were any good as a researcher in international law, you taught the subject and you taught it in a way that inspired people to take it up. And the later uh, panel involving Ralph Wilde and Romiana Yotova will talk about James as a research mentor and an inspirer of the young. But I certainly found that it was remarkable the way in which he could inspire, particularly the students who did research degrees under his direction. If you look at the splendid series of Cambridge monographs on international law, largely built up by him in yet another of his capacities as director of the Lauterbach Centre for International Law at Cambridge University, and as a syndic, as they're rather quaintly called, of the Cambridge University Press. Most of those monographs, he had a, a deep hand in. He was the person who helped to craft the scholarship of the younger scholar who, who authored the book. And that was very much his approach to international law as a whole. He was somebody who believed that it was a living subject. And as a living subject, it couldn't simply be something locked within your own lifetime. It had to be something that you could develop in your work bring on those who will succeed you, and in doing so, ensure that there is a legacy of international law that exists after you've gone. My first meeting with James took place in Cambridge in the early 1980s, roughly 40 years ago. Unfortunately, I didn't record the exact date. I was then a young academic who had only just started in the field. James dropped me a note out of the blue and said he was going to be in Cambridge. Perhaps we could meet and have lunch. I think in the end we met for coffee and cake. 
Um, he was very good at hospitality. And in the course of that short conversation, he was quite remarkable in indicating just how well international law could be developed and what part any of us as the youngsters could have to play in it. I think there can be no better tribute to James as an academic than to look at all of the people he has inspired and who have come after him. Um, we will remember him with great affection and intense admiration. Massimo, thank you very much for inviting me to take part. Thank you very much, Sir Christopher, for those remarks. Uh, I would like to uh, give the floor, the floor now to Dr. Rumiana Yotova, who's tuning in from Cambridge, to speak about James Crawford as a research mentor. Rumiana, over to you. Thank you very much, Massimo and, and Asio. It is really a, a great honor to be with you here today and uh, to be asked to reflect on James as a research mentor. I was one of James's many PhD students, um, and I tried to think about the qualities that made him one of the greatest mentors for many generations of international lawyers who had a profound impact on how I think as an international lawyer and as a researcher, but also how I think as a mentor of, of my own research students today. And I think his key characteristic as a mentor was his generosity. He was generous with his time, with his support, and with the opportunities that he gave to his research students. As you know, James was one of the busiest men in the world. Um, he was the chair of international law in Cambridge, the director of the Lauterbach Center. He had the largest number of PhD students in the law faculty, and he was very active as a barrister, uh, appearing in all of the key international cases at the time. And despite all that, he always had time for his research students. He would make time for us in the middle of ICJ hearings. When I met James for the first time, um, this happened in 2009, uh, and it was in the Great Hall of Justice during the Kosovo hearings where he was appearing uh, on behalf of the UK. I was based at the Permanent Court of Arbitration at the time, and had emailed him about my intention to pursue a PhD in Cambridge. So he suggested that we meet during the hearings. And I remember the great hall buzzing with lawyers during the recess, many of whom were gathered around James. And yet when I approached timidly, he made time to talk to me in the middle of all of this. Um, and I remember his first words to me, which were, how can I help? So before the end of the recess, he had given me feedback on my research ideas and also invited me to work as his research associate before the start of the PhD. When it came to discussing research and meeting his research students, James was undeterred by public holidays or celebrations. We would almost annually meet on New Year's Day and quite early on in the day to discuss a PhD chapter that I had sent him a couple of days earlier. And it was only once uh, when we actually met on Christmas Eve because I had been a bit more organized. Um, so he invited me to drinks with his family before uh, we moved on uh, to proceed with the work. James placed a lot of trust and confidence in his research students. And he offered those of us so inclined to work alongside him uh, on international cases as his research associates. We were all part of the James Powerhouse, experiencing international law as it happened and learning the art of advocacy from one of the very best. James always listened and he never imposed his opinion. He encouraged you to develop your own most of our academic discussions started with James asking the question, what did you think about what was going on? And then he was genuinely interested in hearing your answer. Another strong quality that James had as a mentor was he always knew how to motivate his research students. I remember our first PhD meeting when I told him I wanted to write about 
international public policy. And James um, had some reservations about this topic. He thought it was difficult and that perhaps there weren't enough primary materials for a PhD in it. But instead of telling me not to do it and do something else, he gave me one month to convince him that I could do it. And this really spread me into action. I remember hectically going through uh, domestic and international law reports um, and ending up reading cases from the Court of Arbitration for Sports. But in the end, I did manage to convince James that this was a topic worth pursuing. It was only years later uh, that I learned that James's own PhD supervisor, Sir Ian Brownlee, had also given James a month to convince him of his topic about the creation of states. At the end of each of our PhD meetings, James would always tell me to press on. And here we are today, pressing on as he wanted us to, and trying to pass a little bit of his great legacy as a mentor to the next generations of international researchers. Thank you very much, Rimiana, for those very touching remarks. Um, I would like to give the floor now to Dr. Ralph Wild. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it was an immense uh, privilege, pleasure, and honor to be supervised as a doctoral student by James over two decades ago. The passage of time since has deepened the sense of great fortune I feel at having had the opportunity of sustained and deep contact at a particularly formative time with someone capable of having such a positive personal impact. I'm reminded by the inevitable ups and downs of life that things could have easily been so very different and so how precious the experience was. James was frank, honest, unsparing in criticism, unwaveringly supportive, fair, and sensible. E emails would arrive at all times from around the world. Often responses were instant. Given all that he had to attend to, it seemed magical that there was one person doing everything that he did. And too good to be true, that there was time in all of this for a doctoral student. I remember being with him once in his office as he tapped out something on his computer keyboard and realized he couldn't touch type. I wondered whether this remarkably labor-intensive writing mode somehow pushed the already exceptional Crawford cognitive process to an even more intensive level as the time costs involved in verbosity and revisions would be so high. Certainly his missives and comments on drafts constituted acutely pithy remarks conveying a depth of authority, significance and merit. James could only do everything he did by always and only ever getting straight to the point, distilling things to their essence as quickly as possible. His intellect was so rare it had to be deployed to the maximum effect. Something I took for granted at the time and have come to realize is not necessarily universally followed is that James's approach to supervision was to support the student in their own intellectual project, <clears throat> excuse me, from topic choice to method and approach. Although everything I came up with was put under intense scrutiny, this was always and only on the basis of challenging the ideas in order to make them better. Never did I feel there was even the mildest expectation, let alone suggestion or pressure to follow a particular path. His only concern was quality, significance, originality and rigor. This is difficult, time consuming and high risk it's easier to be more directive. But if supervisor and student pull it off, the result is a work that is the student's own. This is a rare, precious gift for the student in and of itself and in how it serves as an apprenticeship for a vocation as a scholar. <clears throat> 
Now, of course, James' own intellectual career challenges the banal generalist specialist distinction that has arisen in the context of the massive increase in the range and depth of international law since he graduated from Adelaide in 1971. James, the quintessential generalist, made seminal contributions in every specialist area of law he engaged with. And surely the lesson here is that one cannot hope to appreciate the specific without a complete authoritative understanding of the general. This breadth of subject matter was then taken to another level by the remarkably rich and diverse range of approaches enabled through the work of his students. This was only possible because of James's open approach to supervision, allied to an open-minded ecumenical approach to the field and its possibilities. James may not have adopted all these approaches in his own work. Indeed, some of them constituted direct challenges to his own intellectual orientation. But crucially, he was never threatened by this. Some people said James is arrogant, but the impression I got from the comments he would make about his own abilities was that this was not reflective of a desire to be better than other people or to put them down. I got the impression that James would have been perfectly happy had everyone been as good or even better than him. The remarkable effect of James's ecumenical approach was that his students, and here I talk about the others only, not also including myself, have produced works of international law that are not only path-breaking and of the highest quality, but also incredibly diverse in subject matter, approach, and method. There is a Crawford School of International Law in terms of the people who studied under him, but this is not a school of a single approach. It is a school that makes a virtue out of diversity, comprising enabled to realize their own intellectual projects. What great fortune to have been admitted to that school. Finally, and more personally, <clears throat> for me as a British person from a family in the northwest of England, whose parents grew up in a modest two up, two down terrace house with no bathroom, where one had previously stayed at school, no one had stayed at school beyond the age of 16, and a father who was only partially literate, James's lack of pretensions, uh, pretension and absence of grandness and his exclusive focus on aspirations to merit and excellence were of immense significance to me. To have a Cambridge experience that enabled someone of my background, riddled with class-related insecurities and associated behavioral awkwardnesses and ghostness to thrive, is a mark of the positive significance of James's personal character and the especially beneficial impact of that on the university, his students and colleagues. The Sorry, I think the camera went then. Um, the atmosphere at the Lauterpark Centre under his tenure was a model of collegiality with people working in, a, in very different roles in an atmosphere marked by a remarkably unhierarchical, friendly and mutually supportive tone. My memories of that time combined stimulating work challenges and inspiring lectures and discussions with the warmth, fun and friendship of the regular morning coffee meetings, lunches, dinners, barbecues and parties. Thank you, James. Thank you very much, Dr. Wild. Uh, now we will hear it from Mr. Simon Ollison, uh, starting us off on James Crawford as a counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. I'm very grateful to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this event in memory of James. Together with Paul, I've been asked to speak about James as counsel, although my comments will range slightly wider. I worked for and then with James over a period of about 14 years, and he was my mentor and latterly a colleague and a friend. Whilst a second year student at Cambridge, I had attended the lectures on state responsibility given by James on the undergraduate public international law course. But I first came to work with him in the summer of 2001 through NYU's ILC intern program. 
when I had the great good fortune to be assigned to assist James during the final stages of the Commission's work on state responsibility. I continued to work as James's assistant over the next two years, first while studying for the bar in London and then back in Cambridge whilst undertaking a one year graduate research degree. Indeed, much to the annoyance of my supervisor, I spent probably as much time working for James as I did on writing my thesis. But that time was invaluable as an apprenticeship in the real practice of international law. Having qualified, I then worked with James on professional matters over the next 10 years or so until his election to the court. And that brings me to the first point I would like to highlight, which was a point which had already been mentioned, which was James's generosity and support, in particular in mentoring and bringing on more junior lawyers. Um, that generosity was a defining characteristic and it extended across all his activities. Given his very heavy caseload, which I will come to in a moment, James normally had at least one and sometimes more research assistants based at the Lautbach Center to assist both on professional matters and on academic projects. And many of the long list of past occupants of the small antechamber leading to James's office have gone on to careers in international law, both in practice and in academia. This includes a number of practitioners at the English Bar and elsewhere who owe a very great debt to James for his support in helping launch their careers. I very much count myself as one of them. When I had been in practice for about three years, it was thanks to James that I had my first, inform, my first formal instruction on the case before the ICJ in the Black Sea Delimitation as part of a wonderful team, which also included Alain Pellet and Vaughan Lowe. In addition, it is thanks to James that I made my debut before the court. When it came to the hearings, I had assumed my role would be principally to assist James. <clears throat> When, following Ukraine's first round, it became clear that there was a place for a short self-contained speech on the map evidence. It was James who argued strongly that I should do it. The second point I wish to highlight is James's energy and exceptional work rate. He had a truly prodigious appetite and capacity for work. He was interested in everything. And so far as I'm aware, he never turned away an instruction solely on the basis that he was too busy. James's somewhat unconventional working, unconventional working habits are, I think, notorious, notably his tendency to go to bed at around 9 or 10 p.m. and then wake up very early at 4 or even 3 a.m. in order to work. It was entirely normal to receive a reply to an email or detailed comments on the draft at 4 or 5 a.m. Undoubtedly, sometimes this was because he was in the time zone on the other side of the world, but it was by no means always the case. And at times, this caused sleepless nights also for clients. During the second round of one case, James announced that he intended to retire to rest and that he would complete and finalize the still undrafted second half of his speech, starting from around 4 a.m., ready for the hearing the next day. Needless to say, the speech was completed in good time for the agent to review early the next morning over breakfast. It was also subject to disruption by external factors. During another hearing, there was a fire alarm in the early hours after James had gone to bed. And as a result, we ended up standing on the street outside the hotel for an hour or so. And James was in his pajamas, hastily thrown on bathrobe and his work shoes. When we were finally able to, able to return to our rooms, James then turned to the draft of his submissions for the next day. Of course, the full list of James's cases is extremely long starting with his stellar debut before the court in the Nauru case in November 1991, just a few days after his 43rd birthday. It includes approximately 30 cases before the court over the course of the next 23 years, and an even greater number of cases before virtually every other international tribunal. And this was in addition to a very full advisory practice, which perhaps wasn't so apparent, as well as sitting as an arbitrator, acting as, arbit as expert witness, and his teaching and academic writing. To give a better idea of what this entailed in practice, when asked to speak, I dug out an aid memoir which James produced in late 2013, setting out his schedule for 2014. There are noted various faculty commitments in Cambridge, four or five keynote addresses and other speeches at conferences, and the collection of an honorary degree. But in addition, James had no fewer than eight major hearings around the world in the six month period prior to mid-July 2014. This included both the cases heard by the court in that period, the provisional measures in Timor-Leste in January and the lengthy merits hearing in Croatian genocide in February, March, 
followed by a week's hearing in Washington, D.C. in mid-March on an investment matter, after which he went straight into a three-week hearing in Istanbul on the Chagos Islands dispute, finishing in mid-May. Things were then quiet for a few weeks, although this was in reality simply a lull before the coming storm, or perhaps the eye of the hurricane. In the first two weeks of June, he had a two-week hearing on the Croatia-Slovenia maritime delimitation. Then, after an empty week, there were three virtually back-to-back -back hearings across two continents, a week-long BIT hearing in Singapore, then a week in The Hague sitting as arbitrator, followed almost immediately by a week's hearing in London for the Malaysia-Singapore railway lines arbitration. I was involved on two of those cases and was pretty much at full stretch. James, as ever, took it all in his stride, apparently without batting an eyelid. Whilst undoubtedly a particularly busy period, my impression is that it was hardly exceptional. During the hearings on Black Sea, as um, Chris has already mentioned, James also appeared before the court in the hearings on provisional measures in Georgia and Russia, which had been interleaved. And Chris has already mentioned also that he delivered the general course at the Hague Academy whilst also appearing in the whaling case. The written text of the lectures of those lectures was delivered for publication very shortly thereafter, I think actually on the day of the last lecture. And for James, it was a source of some satisfaction and quiet pride that he held the record for the fastest publication in the Recoil. James was extremely effective in leading teams for cases, in creating and maintaining team unity, and in creating a sense of camaraderie. The key was his warmth and openness, and the fact that he listened carefully to all members of the team. And again, his generosity played the role. It was not his style to focus only on his own parts of the case, and he was assiduous in reviewing the drafts of others and making constructive suggestions. And finally, I haven't said anything yet about James as an advocate. The most obvious highlights, including the Declaration of Independence of South Australia in the Kosovo advisory opinions, advisory proceedings, are well known. And James also reflected upon and wrote extensively on advocacy before international tribunals. There is a transcript in the Cambridge Journal of International and Comparative Law of a particularly illuminating discussion with Alain Pellet. Amongst other things, this includes James's views on the telling of jokes, and the appropriate place of Alice in Wonderland and Winnie the Pooh in pleadings before the court. James' advocacy was, I think, a reflection of his character. It is best characterized as quiet and flappy and not unduly flamboyant, although he could be forceful where necessary. Whilst avowedly cerebral and bearing some traces of his background as an academic, his advocacy was direct, practical, and focused on the issues at hand. And again, characteristically, it was leavened with frequent flashes of humor. Whilst pleading for the court is unusual given the absence of any real interaction with the bench, Jones was also extremely adept in responding to more interventionist tribunals, both in arbitration and when he appeared as counsel before the English court. Whilst his reputation preceded him and ensured that tribunals were predisposed to listen attentively to his submissions, that reputation was built on the extremely high quality of his advocacy. In addition to a strong strategic sensibility, James had an unerring ability to identify the key points, to address them in a clear, convincing manner, and to pitch his case in the right way. His submissions were highly effective and compelling, not only due to their content, but also as a result of the way in which they were delivered, with authority and a quiet, modest self-confidence. Quite apart from his undoubted prowess as an advocate, I always had the very clear impression that it was something that James immensely enjoyed. And perhaps my enduring mental image of James is one that can be seen in many of the recordings of his pleadings, although it is one that could be seen frequently in other contexts outside the courtroom. It is of James looking intensely, perhaps somewhat owlishly over his glasses, before cracking a half smile or even a quick flash of a grin if the joke was particularly good. Thank you very much. I hand back to Massimo. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and I would like to give the floor over to uh, Mr. Paul Reichler. Thank you. Thank you very much, Massimo. It is a great privilege for me to participate in this event in honor of James Crawford. Like Simon, I've been asked to speak about James as an advocate, which I will do but I will also speak about him as a colleague and a close friend. 
as an advocate, James was the best I ever saw. And, and I've been around a long time. I think all of us who have been fortunate to practice before the court with some frequency considered him the best among us, certainly among English speaking advocates. And I've had plenty of opportunities to form this judgment. I served alongside him as co-counsel for Georgia before the ICJ, for Bangladesh before ITLOS, and for Bangladesh and Mauritius in interstate arbitrations. And we were opposing counsel in several disputes in the, in the court between Nicaragua and Colombia and between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. The first thing you noticed about James the advocate was how the court took notice of him. Invariably, every judge or arbitrator sat up, leaned forward and focused his or her fullest attention on the man at the podium. James commanded their attention like no other advocate because they respected his authority <clears throat> on the law, his analytical prowess, the clarity of his argument, and his absolute and total honesty and integrity. Herman Melville, author of Moby Dick, once said about Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of my country's greatest sages, quote, I love all men who dive. Any fish can swim near the surface, but it takes a great whale to go downstairs five miles or more. James had a great whale of an intellect, second to none. It's therefore quite fitting that he led Australia's team in the whaling case. He was not only brilliant, but clever. As others have said, he knew how to use humor as a form of argument better than anyone I have ever seen. And he loved doing so. He was tickled by his own jokes and he worked hard on incorporating them just right in his speeches, tailoring them until he regarded them as perfect. He refined his delivery to a fine art. Now, it's not easy to make fun of the other side's argument, which is fair game, without crossing the line into disrespect, which is not appreciated by the court. But James knew just how far to go and just how to go there with an impish smile or a mischievous twinkle in his eye while delivering a devastating blow. As co-counsel, our entire team took heart whenever he rose to speak. A sense of excitement filled our council table. He was our champion and we never doubted that he would come through, that he would be James Crawford. But it was a very different story on the other side and I was there many times. We held our breath during his whole speech, <clears throat> hoping the beating we would take would not be too bad. It was an immense challenge opposing it. You had to perform at your very highest level to have a chance. As I said, he was the best. As an advocate, James was very competitive. He strove very hard to win and he loved winning but he always respected the rules and his opponents. As a colleague, he was one of the kindest, gentlest souls I ever worked with. He was a wonderful teammate, always supporting his colleagues and willing to help them. What an advantage it was having him on our team. Imagine being able to get feedback on your ideas and your draft speeches from none other than James Crawford. Sometimes though, he was too generous to his colleagues, holding back criticism to avoid hurting another's feelings. He was sensitive, he was kind. He was, and I'm not embarrassed to use the word, lovable. And those who were lucky to become close to him 
loved him very deeply. Happily for him, he met the love of his life in Freya, a brilliant international lawyer on her own. They were perfect soulmates and perfect for each other. I recall one night before they were married, when our team was preparing for the final round in the Bangladesh India arbitration. We couldn't find James. He didn't show up at the team meeting. We began to worry. We knocked on his hotel room door. No answer. We feared that he had passed out and we persuaded the hotel manager to let us in. No James. Finally, Philippe Sand suggested we call the home of a woman he had been dating. Sure enough, he was with Freya that night. James showed up at the hearing the next morning, rumpled and bedraggled, wearing tennis shoes, but he performed before the tribunal with his customary brilliance. James was not only a great husband, but also a great father to Sidney and Beatrice. Dinners at James and Freya's home were very enjoyable, but conversation with James was difficult because he was always soothing, pampering, feeding, playing with, and otherwise showering attention on his children. James not only loved his family, he loved the law. He loved justice. He had a strong sense of it, and he viscerally hated injustice, aggression, and war. He was not sympathetic to those who would violently defile or demolish the rules-based international order to which he devoted his professional life. He was proud to represent Georgia in 2008 in opposition to Russia's invasion and occupation of that country. And he was proud of the court when it granted Georgia's request for provisional measures. For these reasons, I believe that in a ceremony in his honor, James would not wish us to ignore the terrible events that have been occurring over the past two weeks in another part of Europe. We cannot know with certitude what exact words James would have used about Russia's unprovoked aggression against Ukraine, its wanton destruction of Ukrainian cities, or the massive civilian casualties it has caused. Although we know his words would have been accurate, intelligent, and profound. I am confident, however, that two of his words would have been these, Slava Ukraina, glory to Ukraine. In passing, James has left a big void in our profession, in our world, that no other mortal can presently fill. We miss him terribly, but we are comforted by the fact that his teachings live on in his many students and publications, and his spirit lives on in all of us whom he touched. In his name, we must dedicate ourselves to restoring, strengthening, preserving and protecting a rules-based international order that tolerates only the peaceful settlement of disputes in accordance with international law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those remarks, Mr. Reitler. And I would like now to uh, give the floor over to our last speaker, Professor John Dugard. Professor, over to you. Thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, let me begin by saying that James and I will be close friends for over 30 years in different parts of the world. I had the misfortune, I suspect, 
to spend the last few months with James. Uh, when James was a member of the court, uh, he lived fairly near to uh, me in The Hague, and I shared with him those last few months, uh, which were really terrible. And uh, Paul has already referred to Freya and Sydney and Eleanor, and I simply wish to place on record the way in which they bravely uh, helped and assisted Jane at that is very, very difficult time. Today we've heard uh, people speak about James the man, James the judge, James the arbitrator, the academic, uh, the counsel. I want to speak this afternoon about James's legacy, his contribution to international law and to the international world order. And I do this largely by reference to his work at the International Law Commission, because it, I think it is here that James made perhaps his greatest contribution to international law. James was a member of the International Law Commission for 10 years. He was elected in 1992 and he uh, retired in 2001. Uh, in the first quinquennium, James was appointed as chairman of the working group on the uh, drafting of the statute for an international criminal court. And it was this uh, draft that served the basis for the uh, Rome Conference of 1998 and resulted in the uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And today it is often forgotten that uh, James was largely responsible for uh, initiating the structure and the foundation of the International Criminal Court. Of course, the Rome Conference did depart in many ways from the uh, proposals of the International Law Commission, but the structure and the foundations of the uh, International Criminal Court were laid by James as chairman of the working group in the International Law Commission on uh, the International Criminal Court. I want to speak mainly about uh, James as a special rapporteur on the uh, responsibility of states uh, for internationally uh, wrongful acts, because I think it is here that he made perhaps his greatest contribution to international law. Uh, at the end of the first quinquennium that James served on the International Law Commission, uh, it became clear that the Ranger Ruiz the special rapporteur would no longer continue in that role. Uh, he had uh, difficulties, disagreements with the commission, and he was not uh, renominated by Italy uh, to serve on the International Law Commission. So James knew that uh, the post would become uh, vacant, and it was made clear that he would become the next special rapporteur on the subject of state responsibility. At this time, uh, I uh, was a visiting professor at uh, Cambridge and uh, largely due to James, I might add, because he was instrumental in uh, inviting me as a visiting professor to Cambridge. James and I went for long walks uh, together and we spoke about the uh, role that he would play in the International Law Commission. And James made it very clear to me that he intended to complete the uh, drafting of the International Law Commission's uh, articles on state responsibility within the next five years. And I said to him, James, the International Law Commission has been working on the subject for over 40 years. Do you really think you're going to complete this task within a five-year period. But of course, James is in the awkward uh, position that uh, there's a convention that uh, members of the International Law Commission from Canada, Australia and New Zealand will only serve one or two terms on the International Law Commission. So James knew that there would be pressure brought to bear on him to retire at the end of the second quinquennium that he had served on the commission. Uh, but I think 
it was more than that. James was in a hurry. He was determined to uh, complete the uh, task before him and to uh, get on with other things in his life. Um, James's task was a difficult one. There were many issues to be dealt with. You will recall that state responsibility was probably the subject in which uh, there were the most arbitration decisions to deal with. And so James had to draft provisions dealing with the codification of uh, international law on state responsibility. But the main difficulty that James faced when he uh, assumed this task was that the draft that he inherited had provided not only for the responsibility of states for civil wrongs, for delicts, but also for international crimes. Of course, you may think this is rather strange today, but you must recall that the Rome Conference of the, uh, on the International Criminal Court had uh, recently met, and there was a spirit of idealism abroad and a determination not only to hold individuals responsible for international crimes, but also to hold states responsible. And this was the uh, environment in which uh, James became a uh, special rapporteur. Now, you may think that this was uh, a silly issue that uh, the International Law Commission could not possibly have uh, dealt with the responsibility of states for international crimes. After all, there was no international criminal court to deal with the criminal conduct of states and no attempt had been made to deal with the general principles of criminal law in respect of states, such as how to uh, determine the intention of a state or the question of punishment of a state. Uh, but many of us on the commission took this matter seriously. I must confess that I was one of those who uh, believed that the International Law Commission should deal with the uh, criminal responsibility of states as well. James realized that the commission was divided on the subject, and so wisely he deferred taking a final uh, decision on this subject. He didn't reject us as a bunch of crazy idealists, but instead he respected our views and uh, said that he would consider them seriously and uh, come up with some alternative that might be acceptable uh, to everyone. And he did. He came up with what one might describe as a two-tier system, which distinguishes between ordinary rules of international law and uh, peremptory norms of international law. And you must remember that at this time, peremptory norms of international law were not generally accepted. Uh, of course, the uh, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties had provided for peremptory norms, but a number of states, particularly France, were bitterly opposed to the idea of Juskogens or peremptory norms. And of course, the International Court of Justice had carefully avoided giving its approval to uh, peremptory norms. It only did so in 2006. And this was the environment in which James operated as special rapporteur. But ultimately he persuaded the commission to accept his notion of a two-tier system of international law uh, in these very important principles contained in articles 40, 41, 48, and 54 of the draft articles on state responsibility. You will recall that article 40 provided for uh, peremptory norms. Uh, article 41 provided that uh, states that violated peremptory norms should not benefit in any way from their acquisitions or their wrongdoing that these should be uh, subjected to non-recognition and no state should aid any state who had violated a peremptory norm. Uh, 
And then we got Article 14.8.1, which provided that a non-injured state might uh, bring a claim or hold another state responsible for uh, violating an obligation that was owed to the international community as a whole. And Article 54, which dealt with the uh, question of countermeasures, uh, which might be brought by non-injured states in the same circumstances. Uh, of course, this was possible because this was a time of great uh, idealism in international law. The Cold War had recently ended, apartheid had been brought to an end, the Oslo Accords had brought an end to the Israel-Palestine conflict, at least temporarily, and uh, it was before the invasion uh, of uh, Iraq. And international law was seen as a system of international law, not simply a rules-based order as uh, presidents such as President Biden referred to it today. Uh, it was a combination of uh, positive rules of international law and values and legal idealism. James Crawford seized the opportunity in this environment to uh, propose his two-tier system uh, state responsibility. But in order to achieve this, he had to compromise on many issues with the members of the International Law Commission. The International Law Commission can be a very difficult body. James was a skillful compromiser. He would compromise on small issues, but never on issues of principle. The result was that his vision was untouched. And he did succeed in 2001 uh, in uh, producing the draft articles on state responsibility. During the time on the commission, uh, a number of us stayed in a uh, hotel in Ferney Voltaire across the uh, border in France, uh, in the Citadine. And uh, James and Alain Pelle and I were all in this hotel. Uh, I had a room near or next door to Alain Pelle. And I remember if I would wake up late at night, I would see Alain's light still on at about two or three o'clock in the morning. And then I would hear a noise at about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, and that was James arriving at Alain's room with, uh, to uh, hear Alain's proposals and to exchange drafts because James, as Simon Ollison has pointed out, started his working day at uh, 3 a.m. Let me just conclude by saying that uh, James, realized that states were not ready for the draft articles on international uh, responsibility of states. And he was opposed to the adoption of a treaty, the holding of a conference to uh, adopt a treaty on the subject. He realized that states would probably accept the provisions of the draft articles dealing with the codification of international law, but they would reject articles 40, 41, 48, and uh, 54. So that's largely the reason why there has been no pressure brought to bear on the United Nations to hold an international uh, conference to uh, convert the draft articles into uh, a multilateral uh, treaty. But they are with us today, and they have been approved by the International Court of Justice and other tribunals in many respects. And I think they do play, or will play, I hope they will play an important role in the future. As Paul Reichlein said, we do live in dark times, but history shows us that the light often follows darkness and that we might expect 
a brave new world. And I hope that in this brave new world, states will be influenced by James's idealism. We've seen that in the invasion of Ukraine, states have united in refusing to recognize the uh, statehood of Donetsk and Luhansk, and they have refused to come to the assistance of the wrongdoer, Russia. Hopefully states will impose countermeasures on Russia in accordance with the draft articles on state's responsibility. So I do believe that there is a place for James's draft articles on state responsibility in the new world order that one hopes will come about in the wake of the present crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dugard. Uh, I think that that is an excellent note on which to uh, close our event today in memoriam of James Crawford. I would only like to uh, conclude with three uh, words, Vale, James Crawford.